is the sort of glider you might remember. A central keel and a couple of battens. Compared to the gliding abilities of a modern machine, their performance was closer to a controlled plummet rather than a flight. These were the typical delta wings and are remarkably similar to the contraption that was to give birth to the modern hang glider. In this never before seen film, Francis Regolo, one of NASA's senior scientists in the immediate post-war period, tests the flying capabilities of the flexible delta wing model. Even though the entire development of hang gliding has taken place in the last 40 years, the sport has more myths and misconceptions than any other surrounding who its inventor was and how it took off. We're in a unique position to correct almost all the texts ever written about the early days of the sport because the World Championships brought together three men who really were responsible for the modern sport of hang gliding. Three men who had never all met before. Francis Regalo, the NASA scientist who carried out the world's first experiments and first realised the potential of the flexible delta wing. Bill Moyes, the daredevil Australian who was generally credited with inventing the hang glider. The father of the sport and the owner of one of the biggest hang glider producing shops in the world. And John Dickinson, the quiet North Coast salesman, the man who really did invent the hang glider. It was an effort to uh, find out a way to make an airplane that would be uh, simpler and more uh, uh, unbreakable and maybe foldable so that uh, uh, people could uh, carry it easily or store it in their garage and so on, so that ordinary people could uh, own a, an airplane uh, just as they do a, a private car. I, I started working on this right after the war in 1945. Uh, thinking this way and it was about 1948 when I got the idea that maybe it could be completely flexible and, and made models and got some uh, uh, kites and gliders to work uh, at pro uh, successfully in that manner. The models were indeed tiny. It meant he had a hard time convincing NASA that what looked like an advanced paper plane had a practical application. But Regalo finally did convince the powers at NASA that the kite could be used for more than just transporting little weights across an office. He saw it as the perfect re-entry vehicle for the then new Gemini space capsule. It was a photograph of those full-scale tests that caught the eye of a young New South Wales North Coast sales manager. It was John Dickinson who saw this photograph and realised it was just what he needed, a crowd puller for the 1963 Grafton Jacaranda Festival. His early interpretations, with himself strapped in, crashed sometimes horribly. But despite some serious dunkings, he finally got his delta wing to work. It was a water skier called Rod Fuller who, after several false starts in September 1963, flew a Dickinson kite around behind a ski boat and landed it back near the beach under perfect control. Dickinson had what he needed for the Jacaranda Festival made from Oregon timber and flapping blue banana plastic, he discovered that his device, once at the top of the rope, could glide to earth, not stall and drop out of the sky like other toad kites that were popular at the time. It was a great idea, an idea he spent two years flying and trying to sell before he met Bill Moyes. Bill was persuaded to try the kite by another famous Sydney cider, Jellignite Jack Murray. Bill met John on the harbour one day, and with Dickinson away ferrying the previous pilots off to hospital, Moyes strapped in behind a new speedboat driver. He went straight to the top of the rope. Uh, then when we came back, I met a set of high tension wires across the river, and I hadn't told the driver how to get me down, so I said, I'm going to find out if this thing flies, I just let it go and it flew. So uh, from then on, I've had a lot of fun with it. What was that experience like when it first flew by itself? I expected it. Uh, John had written two Fullscope pages on how it should fly and they were typed and not handwritten so I figured this was the work of a professional and must have to do So uh, it, it went exactly as John had said and uh, when John had, I was having lunch uh, John arrived back from the hospital and uh, he said, uh, said hey that guy, that, that guy's flown the kite and he rushed up to me and said how did it fly? I said, just like you said in the pages. He said, did it? <laughs> that was the first time that I knew that I was the bunny. But Bill became far more than just a test pilot. 
In fact, from the time I first flew in 1963 to uh, the time I met Bill, uh, I've tried absolutely everything. Uh, I was literally possessed by the thing. I knew what I'd done, but I just couldn't seem to get anybody to understand what I had done. And uh, uh, with this, this invention of Wing of <coughs> France. Now, uh, <coughs> however, the, it was Bill Moyes who understood what I was about and what I was talking about. And the sport, in inverted commas, of hang gliding is really has come from Bill Morris. The minute that he foot launched that glider, released it from the tow rope into climbing flight, he changed the whole nature of, um, of uh, aerodynamics. So certainly Francis and I provided the hardware, but the father of hang gliding is Bill Morris. We believe that uh, it had to be, uh, it needed a 30 mile an hour airspeed to, to take off, and you can't run that fast. So I was tethering the thing uh, in, uh, in a strong wind at La Perouse, uh, and I had a, another friend holding the rope. And I was up there for some five minutes, and I noticed, to begin with, he was exerting a lot of strain on the rope to hold it. And after a few minutes, he was standing there, and the rope was loose. And I, I said, hey, aren't you holding that rope? And he shook the rope to show that there was no load in it. So uh, I let the rope go. He stayed there for 32 minutes, just sawing back and forth on that dune at the golf course uh, over overlooking La Perouse. And John was very impressed with this, but I, I didn't realize again that uh, we'd hurdled another gap. And I, I understood exactly what he'd done. I, uh, I had uh, uh, been a fringe enthusiast, I suppose, in gliding, and knew a great, great deal about it. And I realised then that it was only a matter of time with further technical development, increasing the aspect ratio, getting more efficiency, that, that people would be leaping off cliffs all over the place and flying. I could see it in my mind as clear as crystal. Phil Moyes realised the picture in Dickinson's mind. At fairgrounds and displays around the country, Birdman Bill was there. Perhaps his greatest publicity, though, came from a terrible accident and one of his displays went terribly wrong at the Melbourne showground. It was an accident that saw him land in hospital, three broken ribs and several breaks in his pelvis. He recovered and this time took the travelling show overseas. It was headline stunts all the way, a flight off the loop of the Grand Canyon, world altitude records. Everywhere you looked, there was Birdman Bill from down under. It worked. In time, everyone was doing it. But just as the new sport was taking off, Dickinson, its bona fide inventor, walked away from it. So why didn't you say anything like Well, the fact is that having been possessed of the thing for such a long time, that uh, my job was suffering, my career was suffering, um, some of my home life was suffering, and uh, I either had to throw absolutely everything into it financially, everything I owned and possessed, and a fair bit had gone in already, uh, or turn around and walk away from it. And uh, that is, in effect, exactly what I did. John divested himself of the whole thing so successfully that even in hardened hang gliding circles, no one has ever heard of him. The hang gliding tomes that document the birth of the sport don't mention him. It's only now that his contribution is being acknowledged beyond Moyes and Regalo. This was Dickinson's first interview since saying goodbye to Bill Moyes in 1968. His is a contribution to aviation generally that's never been properly acknowledged. But despite missing out on the glory, his invention has paid off. In 1977, I visited Europe and um, I um, went to the top of Riga Mountain. And we just arrived there and three or four guys turned up with um, hang gliders. So they may even have been Bill Moyes gliders and leapt off a 6,000 foot mountain there and uh, I, I was just let goggle-eyed and open-mouthed at these guys leaping into a 6,000 foot shear drop in the machine that I designed. I didn't know who I was, I didn't speak to them, but uh, it left me with tears in my eyes to see these guys climb away as they got into their prone harness and fly like eagles. And boy, that is really something to know that you're a part of. It.